Welcome to the Blue Cafe. We offer stories of infidelity, betrayal, and redemption. Please like and subscribe. Cheers. Now, on to today's story. My life was wrecked, previous links and tl slash dr at the bottom though I'm not sure where to begin, I don't want to leave anything out. I do have a sense of what I hope to convey when I'm done. It's just very hard to discuss any one aspect of my situation that doesn't branch into other parts of my life. If this sounds disjointed, forgive me, but this will be a long read. Because the life I was living has been gone long enough to the point it feels like that was all a dream I woke up from. The best analogy I can give is that Mari cast Michael, Carrie, and me in a tawdry reality show against our will and without our knowledge. The show got cancelled, the facade was revealed, and we're left with the cold reality of our collective reality. Not a day goes by that I don't think about how happy I was in my old life. But now knowing it was all a complete and utter lie built upon lies, I wouldn't want it back. The biggest news I need to share is that I am no longer legally Carrie's father. I have never been her father biologically. My name is off of her birth certificate. Officially, because Mari and I are still married, I am now Carrie's stepdad as odd as that sounds and is to say. When the divorce is finalized, as things presently stand, I will officially be nothing to her, nor her to me. What should have taken about two months to do, took four months because there was an upcoming divorce to consider. My name had to be removed from her birth certificate to properly forge ahead with the divorce. Legally I had every right to pursue having my name removed from the birth certificate of a child that is not biologically mine. It was still left up to the ruling of a judge to adjudicate if removing my name was in the best interest of the child. DNA is legally binding to make you pay child support for 18 years. But our court systems find that of secondary importance when it comes to removing names from legal documents. I was willing and able to show the judge I will voluntarily be continuing to pay Carrie's health and supplemental insurances. Many guys in my situation couldn't do that, nor should they have to. None of it should be left up to a judge's ruling. The unjust system didn't affect me. That doesn't mean it is remotely fair. From the moment I first knew Carrie was not my daughter I have pondered over and over in my mind how to best handle the situation. Yes, learning she isn't mine emotionally destroyed me in ways which I don't think I could verbalize. But addressing Carrie's situation with emotion would have been a recipe for disaster. Our emotions betray us because they are not based on reason and logic. Allowing my love for Carrie guide me would have been just as stupid as allowing my hate for Mari guide me. And legally, I had every right to cut all ties with Mari and Carrie as neither one was ever mine. Morally I could not let Carrie suffer economically because of her mother's rampant promiscuity. Ethically I could not allow her to feel any of what her mother did was her fault in any way. At the end of the day and after a lot of soul searching, I came to the realization she and I were both victimized by Mari. My soon-to-be ex-wife removed my agency in regard to every aspect of our relationship when she cheated. I wasn't told she no longer loved me or never actually did. I was not allowed to know she'd been unfaithful. I wasn't informed I was no longer her one and only. I was kept from learning she conceived a baby with a stranger and had me raise that child as my own for six years. Carrie didn't get a say as to whether she would have chosen me as her dad. She never got a voice to tell her mother what she had done to us both was sheer evil. I wanted to give us both a voice. The day after my name was officially removed from Carrie's birth certificate, I filed a petition to legally adopt her as my daughter. That had been my plan all along, once I could be certain just seeing her wouldn't be a reminder of her mother's betrayal. I just had to know that one thing to be sure. And I didn't know it until I saw her face to face, after learning she's not my biological daughter. If seeing her had felt like the slap in the face her mother gave me when I caught her cheating, I couldn't have done it. People are free to think I'm wrong for feeling that way. Fragile masculinity I believe was the term a toxic feminist used toward me when I wasn't sure how I'd react seeing Carrie again. If I had totally abandoned Mari and Carrie which I had every legal right to do, I still wouldn't be in the wrong. 
And I won't pretend that keeping Michael in my life didn't influence my decisions, since Carrie is his sister and Mari is his mom. He's a good big brother and she loves him, that fact mattered in the choices I have made. But Carrie is my daughter. No, it is not to the same extent as Michael is my son, because he is blood related. But I'm her dad and I want her to remain in my life. I just felt I needed to legally set the record straight and open avenues to opportunities we never got. On the surface, it seems like pointless legal actions to get right back where I stood. My marriage was a lie, the relationship I had with Mari was a charade, most likely from day one. What I deserve is a do-over, a chance to pick a different woman to love in the hopes she might be faithful and loyal. But I can never have that. I can never know what might have been, even if anything I could have done would have been better than to marry a disloyal harlot. The kids won't learn the details of their mother's promiscuity and betrayal for many years. But I want them, particularly Carrie, to eventually know my struggle to keep it together and protect them. I want her to understand that as much as I despise her mother, that I gave myself the option to choose or not choose her as my daughter. I chose Carrie. When the judge asks that poor innocent little girl if she wants me to be her daddy again, I want her to say yes without a thought. Only years from now will she grasp that she truly chose me to be her dad, she had options too. We were thrown together and had no say in the matter. But I'm doing everything I legally can to adopt her as my own flesh and blood even if she's not. One day when she's an adult and realizes I gave her the chance to be free of me and she didn't take it, I want her to smile. I want her to know I didn't have to be her dad, I chose to be her dad. In a way that makes our bond stronger than blood. There are a few people I'm related to I'd rather not be, but I didn't get a say in that matter. Carrie and I chose each other when we both could have bailed. She knows I love her, and always will. It's been hard to function just taking one day at a time just to get through the hell that has become my life. It's draining. But I have also pondered on how I want the kids to perceive all of this, years after the fact, when they are adults. When they learn of their mother's activities, how I caught her, and what I uncovered, I want them to be revolted. When Carrie understands I didn't owe one penny toward continuing to raise her but did it anyway, I want her to feel grateful. When she understands that her mom put us both in an impossible situation, but we made it through together, I want her to be happy we made it. When they both realize their stability could have been totally destroyed due to their mom, but I held it all together for the three of us, I want them to understand at least part of my sacrifice. There won't be any revisionist lies being told 10 or 20 years from now. I know their mother is a worthless, selfish, wretched excuse for a human being. One day, they will know that truth too, and I hope they both shun her from their lives for what she did. But that will be for them to determine when truth is revealed. All I can do is remove Mari from my life in every way possible and keep living. What happens to her is of no concern to me. The kids are all that matter now. Quite a few people messaged me asking how I handled Mari telling the kids we could never get back together because I could never love her again. The very next day after school I took them both out for ice cream at a local park. Michael seemed resigned to the fact I don't love their mom but didn't like it. Carrie didn't like hearing that I don't love her mom and me telling her that her mom doesn't really love me didn't help. There was a lot of crying and confusion on their part. I was sure to tell them without a doubt that their mom genuinely does love them, and I love them more than anything in this world. But they needed to hear the truth and face a reality none of us asked for. I told them I know they both love me and love their mom. That was really all that was important. Carrie asked me why I don't love her mother. I wanted to be as honest as I could be with her. But I didn't think there was any age appropriate way to tell her that her mother is a batshit crazy whore. Telling her that her mom lied to me and hurt me was all I could come up with. She hugged me to try and console me. It nearly broke my heart, considering she had things to be consoled over she didn't know about yet. Michael asked me what was going to happen concerning the divorce. I told them that they would live with me, and I'd look after them in their home during the week. I explained the court would figure out what weekends they would stay at their grandparents' house with their mom. 
I promised them their mother and I would keep arguing between us from that point forward. I explained that she and I had a long talk the night before, after they got home. Carrie said she wanted her mother to stay with us. It hurt me to tell her that was never happening ever again under any circumstances. But she had to be told. She said her mommy had said she wanted to come back and stay with us. I looked her straight in the eye and told her I have no doubt their mom would like to keep staying with us. I told them both that it was impossible for me to explain at that time, but their mother had betrayed all three of us. I said they weren't old enough to understand at that moment. But I promised one day I would tell them exactly why I felt their mom didn't deserve to live with us anymore. Carrie seemed to accept that more than Michael oddly. He began to ask how old he had to be to know what his mom did. He didn't like it when I told him it had nothing to do with age but instead a maturity level. He said it was a cop out. I didn't argue with him. I said I wanted them to love their mom and treat her with respect. Because as far as they know she has done nothing wrong to them. They will know someday. I will leave letters to them in my will if I have to just in case Rebecca is banging some ex-con who is willing to kill me. Barring that, I will tell them myself when they are old enough, knowing it will negatively influence their opinion of her. I have a feeling they will soon see a version of their mother that will do much of that for me. One day they will know what she did to all of us, but we stuck together and made a decent life for her three biggest victims. I'm not capable of faking it in front of them and acting like their mom means anything to me. Their mother is completely repulsive, in all ways. If she died, I would not shed one tear for her vile soul as she splits hell wide open. She deserves it. I hate her for what she has done to me and the children. I hate her for what she has allowed herself to become. I hate her for the stress and tears she has brought to our extended families. She deserves no forgiveness, chances, and least of all compassion. I don't consider her injuries in the wreck karma, just pain and suffering she deserves. True karma would have figured out a way to not ruin my car and would have done a lot worse than the injuries she got. I heard through the kids their mommy was having pins removed from her shoulder the next day. I didn't tell them I hoped they used a strong electromagnet to do it, but it was hard not to. A few weeks after our talk the kids came home from their grandparents house with a letter via my son. It was sealed in an envelope with my name on the front. I couldn't throw it away in front of the kids, so I just placed it on the counter with the junk mail. After I got the kids to bed, I passed by the letter and decided to read it. Mari started out apologizing to me for hurting me. Claimed she never meant to let things get that far. Forgot who she was and wanted to be. She apologized for hurting the kids. As much as I despise her, I had to give her credit. If she'd stopped there, I might have given her a bit of respect. Then she wrote that she still loved me with all her heart, always has, and always will. I needed the laugh, I really did, because I knew she actually believed the BS she wrote. That's what made it so funny. But when I kept reading, she claimed that's why she didn't want to develop feelings for any other guy, because her heart belonged to me. I wanted to laugh. Couldn't. She couldn't give her body to others if she loved me. She couldn't have done something so hurtful if she loved me. She said giving only her body to other men allowed her to know what it was like to be young and free of responsibility and commitments. Since she never got to experience that. So, since she never had any emotional bond with any of the men, her heart only and always belonged to me. In other words, her affairs were strictly physical. She meant that in a positive way that only the sickest pervert could rationalize. By essentially ghosting Mari, it shielded me from more of her lunacy. I felt I needed to do that for my own sanity. Yet I have also shielded myself from understanding the depths of her depravity in mind and body. I've thought thousands of times since D-Day that I never knew her. What she chose to write to me let me know she never knew me. She wasn't even trying to piss me off, I could tell by the way she wrote it. Her words were essentially telling me her actions were the lesser of two evils. To her, the lack of emotions toward other men, saved her heart for me. That was essentially her rationale. I understand knowing your significant other is having a strictly emotional affair is soul crushing. But no one ever got STDs from an emotional affair. 
No one ever punched an emotional affair partner through a cell phone or computer. And no one ever conceived a child over phone calls, emails, and texts for another man to raise. I can say with 100% certainty I would have rather she'd had thousands of emotional affairs and kept anything from ever becoming physical. The fact she doesn't grasp that about me, screams, I never knew you. She chose the worst of two evils in my eyes and never knew me well enough to know that. I have read many of the posts written by others here. I have yet to read that anyone so said, things never got emotional. That's essentially what she's claiming. Yet she doesn't grasp she's admitting to living the last six years of her life as little more than an unevolved, hedonistic, rutting pig. That's how unintelligent animals behave, unable to control their sexual urges and behavior. She understood her acts were wrong and yet felt somewhat validated for what she did in the way she did it. Until that letter, I'd had little insight into how she perceived things she did eagerly, with no conscious. The depths of depravity she not only condoned but welcomed removed every ounce of attraction I have for her. I'll forever have mind movies in my head because of her. They were bad after only catching her with that random guy. They got worse after she admitted to cheating with enough men to fully staff an aircraft carrier. But when the pie showed me the recovered texts, pictures, and videos from her old phone, it broke something in my psyche. It's like I was married to Pornhub for six years. Anyone that finds out their significant other had a one night stand I sympathize with you so much. People that learn their so was having an affair with someone, my heart truly breaks for you. But I can't put into words what it's like to know the love of your life was being defiled like the sleaziest prostitute of ancient Rome and enjoying it. I cannot picture Mari in my mind now without imagining ejaculation all over her face. She disgusts me that much and that is how debased I will view her forever. No amount of emotional bonding with someone else was ever going to make me think that horribly of her. Unworthy in an instant that she turned into a six year time bomb. The motion to adopt Carrie was the second or third biggest thing Mari had to worry about the day I filed paperwork. At noon, a sheriff's deputy showed up at her parents' house to serve her with the divorce papers. At 10 minutes past noon, another deputy showed up to serve her with paperwork due to the civil suit I filed against her. The calls and texts from her parents' phones went unanswered and unread. Calls to my lawyer were met with urging to get her own legal counsel to get the ball rolling. That wasn't what she wanted to hear. I'm told she screamed and yelled at several staff members that day. Nadia eventually told her that the divorce would proceed, like it or not. Any further harassment to her or her staff would be severely dealt with. I kind of wish Mari had kept pushing. Orange was never her color, but what she's done should truly be criminal. It was over a week later that a lawyer representing her phoned Nadia and they had their first discussion. He asked if we were serious about the civil suit to try and recover expenses incurred raising a child that isn't mine. Nadia assured him we were going to try and recover every cent incurred due to paternity fraud. She refused to tell him none of it is about money. Even if I win, the odds are high I will see little or none of what any court awards. But if I win, it will be money coming out of any and every paycheck going to me until paid in full. It would be a costly reminder and punishment for what she's done. And even if I lose, she has to pay a lawyer to represent her and that's more expenses she can't afford. He said he understood the vast majority of assets including the family home were mine long before we married. But he urged that we couldn't honestly expect to get custody of both kids, have her pay child support and for her to live with no spousal support after a severe accident. Nadia told him his client had been unfaithful in the marriage long before the wreck and that she picked a bad time to get caught. She informed him our goal was to make it as painful for Mari as possible. Her car was the only item of any value in her name, which was in her possession, and she could keep it. Mari was allowed to keep her retirement savings as her own because my portfolio dwarfed hers. She wouldn't have even had that 401k without my urging she put in the maximum allowed each pay period. She never had to contribute to any utilities. Buying her own car and paying her own insurance was her only expense. The rest of her money was her own. Now she gets to live on it. 
I know she's already feeling the financial pinch and it's just going to get worse for her. If I win the civil suit, Starbucks sales will plummet. But it has to be done. I just don't think she ever expected I'd go to the lengths I am. As far as cars go, I drove her car around for a few months after my car was wrecked. Being the only thing of value that she owned, adding mileage to the car was satisfying even if it was petty. But I bought a beautiful new SUV and got my buddy to follow me in it as I drove Mari's car to her parents. I left the key in the mailbox with no idea when she'd be able to drive again. Given her past, I was sure she'd be on the hunt for strange D as soon as she was able. I hoped living with her mom and dad was making her feel young and free of responsibility. However, having random men come sleep over at her parents' house is just tacky. She would eventually need some place classy to offer her genitals to strangers, like a 2020 Acura. I thought about donating her car to the local community college criminal justice department. Those candidates would be experts on the use of luminol by the time they became actual police. As warped as it sounds, the most satisfying thing about dropping that car off was the spare tire. It doesn't have one, never did. That was a major point I gave her when she asked my opinion about purchasing the car. I remember her saying all sweet and cute she had me to call if she ever got a flat. It was all I could do not to leave a note under the trunk mat saying something like, bet you wish you had a spare now. But I'm sure eventually she'll get the message all on her own. A few days after the lawyers spoke on the phone, they met in person to discuss things. Her side wanted a meeting to discuss Carrie's situation. Even if I didn't want to, I didn't want her putting up walls to prevent me from adopting Carrie. I agreed for our daughter's sake, and we met them at Nadia's firm. I was seated in the main conference room when Nadia walked in with opposing counsel and Mari. I had never truly understood what people meant when they said someone looked road hard and put away wet until that moment. She looked horrible. For quite a few minutes I thought my eyes were just deceiving me with some sort of blood rage hatred hallucination toward her. It wasn't until Nadia gave me a side eye glance due to my ex's appearance that I finally knew I wasn't tripping. She'd lost weight to the point that the sides of her face were ever so slightly concave. She'd never been fat and shed the baby weight both times with these. She looked like she had an appointment to get her mug shot taken in Florida. She'd cut her hair. It wasn't quite a Karen cut, but it was Karen-esque. And it looked like it hadn't been washed since the wreck. I'm not sure what she could have worn that would have been flattering. But I swear I made sure she got all her clothes back. So, nobody could blame me for that ensemble. The two lawyers discussed some things back and forth to start the meeting. I could feel Mari's eyes on me, but I didn't want to look in that direction. I wanted to convey hatred and scorn if I looked at her. When I finally glanced her way, I wondered where the beautiful girl I once knew had gone. Bullet dodged. From beautiful to bag lady in six months. Now I'm just somebody that she used to blow. Thankfully we began discussing Carrie, to take my mind off of how rough she looked. They asked if there had been any attempt to find Carrie's biological father yet. I told them nothing pertaining to that was going to take place until the divorce and custody issues were totally finalized. I then asked if she'd remembered any names that might lead us to baby daddy number two. I felt trashy just saying it, and she didn't like hearing it, but truth is truth. She said no names from that time in her life came to mind. I asked if she had any plans to block me from legally adopting Carrie. She insisted she wished I never had my name removed in the first place, she certainly wasn't going to try and keep me from putting it back. That was all I needed to know. Have a nice day, drive safely, nope. Before I could stand up to try and urge the meeting to end Mari asked me, could you have forgiven me and taken me back as your wife after my first mistake if I confessed to it and swore on my life to never stray again? She got me. It's a question I knew she had asked herself over and over since the first night she strayed. It's a question she knew the answer to and so did I and that was the sticking point. Just asking the question was her way of making a statement. She knew giving her body to anyone else in my eyes was an act that would cause me to remove her from my life as instantly and permanently as possible. 
We had discussed many times how we would both treat being cheated on. I told her if I ever found out she cheated I wouldn't listen to another word she ever said. The time to talk was before infidelity, everything after is just noise, excuses, and hot air. After several minutes of silence, I reluctantly told her she already knew I would not have given her a second chance. Then I asked her if I'd had an affair with a baby with a random hook up and brought it home six years later if she'd look after it. It got ugly from there. She said I was doing everything in my power to hurt her now. I didn't deny it. She said I'm not her parents and that I don't get to punish her for being bad in reference to the civil suit. I made sure she understood the divorce was to punish her. The civil suit was hopefully literal payback I was owed. She said I'd destroy the kid's life to destroy her. I told her she looked like she'd been smoking meth but after that accusation I had proof. She started to cry and tell me she loves me, I just rolled my eyes. Because her tears now garner no sympathy from me and only make me want to treat her even crueler. I promised her the kids would always be well fed and well dressed but made sure she understood I didn't care if she starved or had to wear a sackcloth. At one point in my life, I would have done anything and given anything to make her happy. I asked her if my all wasn't good enough for her to be faithful, what more I could have done for her to not betray me. She said she betrayed herself. I yelled that she betrayed Carrie. I told her she betrayed everyone in her life. The lawyers calmed things down, and Nadia shared a proposed temporary visitation agreement with them. Knowing which weeks she will have them, will allow her to schedule doctor appointments better. I warned her that while it is none of my business what she does, nor do I care, not to have any strange men around the kids. She said she hadn't been with anyone. She didn't like me pointing out she told me that once or twice before. But she promised if that time came, she would shield the kids from all of it. I asked her if anyone other than Rebecca knew she had been unfaithful to me. She said she admitted only the kissing to her sister after the first incident. Her sister freaked and cursed her the hell out for five straight minutes. Mari knew she could never tell her sister how far she actually went. But no one but Rebecca knew about all the hookups. She asked if there was any chance of us getting counseling to see if things could work out between us. I asked her why I would want a marriage with a dead bedroom. She pointed out we never had a dead bedroom. I explained it was sure as hell dead now because I'd never touch her nasty ass again with a body count higher than COVID. Mari asked if I hated her. I'm not sure if that was a yes or no question, but with every fiber of my being, will have to suffice. So, there's that. And that's essentially where we are. Just waiting for the divorce case to go before a judge. The civil case can't even go on a docket list until the divorce trial ends. The kids are doing well, given the circumstances. They get to see both sets of grandparents more. If there is any positive in this mess, there is that. And yes, I know I have to let go of the hate. I am seeing a therapist. But it took me quite a while to find one I like. Even she acknowledges I have a lot of legitimate reasons to hate Mari. I'm not the kind to seek validation. But knowing my hate isn't irrational helps quite a bit. I know it isn't good for me. My new therapist is helping me vent and try to let go. I'm not very good at meditation, but it's new to me. My first therapist was okay for about four sessions. The first session is always essentially introductions, no matter how much you share on the paperwork. She seemed very positive at first. Sympathetic yet encouraging. She assured me I was doing better than most at being a good dad, which was nice to hear. But when we started talking about issues in the past before the cheating started her tone changed. It's not a direct quote, but she kind of insinuated that sometimes we do things that hurt or irritate our partner, but they say nothing. If those issues fester for weeks, months or years, it's like a powder keg that we helped create. No, she didn't have a Belgian accent. But I do have enough pride and common sense to know that despite any and all my faults and mistakes, no part of me deserved what Mari did. Nothing I had ever done to her made even 1% of what she did to me righteous actions. So, I got a new shrink. I tried a few therapy sessions with a guy. He could understand the feelings of emasculation and mind movies. 
he could grasp how it's all overwhelming. I just didn't feel comfortable with him. Thank God I'm pretty much all cried out. But if I have to talk about some emotional shit, I don't want to cry in front of a guy. Guys are for drinking, playing sports with, and fighting. We don't discuss why Gary's wife is emotionally unavailable to him and doesn't understand his love language. This guy doesn't anyway. Part of me wanted to give him more of a chance. But I didn't see us developing any rapport. If it makes me sexist, so be it. I just feel more comfortable confiding in a woman. That's my preference, and I finally got a good shrink. She was the only daughter in her family with three brothers which takes care of having some understanding of men. Her specialty is coping with infidelity and grief counseling. When I told her about the events that led me there, she used half of a box of tissues. She said she's amazed I'm doing as well as I am. Still not sure if that was meant as encouragement or genuine shock. I'm not institutionalized. I'll call my therapist Sarah for the purpose of this post. But she's helped me quite a bit just by listening. She says I am difficult to read and that my outward appearance doesn't match my friendly personality. She noted that I use humor to diffuse tense situations and disarm people. I told her it ruins the fun if she calls me out on my BS beforehand. But she is figuring me out. She says I have to figure me out now. She was adamant she was there to help. But rebuilding my life and myself, it's going to take effort by me. I can't just pay someone else to do the work for me. I'm going to have to take stock and see how genuinely damaged I am, repair what I can, amputate what I can't. It's going to hurt, even more than I've already hurt. But I have to come to peace with all I've lost because it's not coming back. The kids see their own shrink, 40 minutes with each and then 40 minutes with the three of us, twice a week. They've been doing great. The therapy is allowing them to come to terms with the inevitable. I was a little concerned how family therapy was going to go due to how I feel about their mom. I've been silent in sessions when they have expressed missing their mom or wishing we were all still together. I thought about showing them on the doll where Mari hurt me, but dolls don't have a soul. Sometimes I don't feel like I have one anymore either. I have gone out of my way to try to be sociable and lean on friends. But given what I have ahead of me, small talk feels too trivial. I know friends are tired of me venting, I would be. I've tried to not go on a rant, but the betrayal still eats at me. It's still always at the back of my mind. Then of course if we go out for drinks, they are pointing out this girl or that girl. Like I know they are conventionally pretty, but I have no interest in getting to know them. And unlike my wife, the hygiene issues alone would prevent me from doing any hookup activity even if given the chance. Rest assured, none of these young ladies has left any of the establishments suicidal because they couldn't bed me. The lack of interest was totally mutual, nobody loses. But this hasn't just affected the way I look at women, it's changed the way I've looked at people. I feel like I'm second guessing everyone's identity and sincerity. Before all of this, Mari was someone I truly admired. It makes me question the other people in my life both male and female that I've admired over the years. She hasn't made me a misogynist, she turned me into a misanthropist. Despite any shame or guilt she feels for what she's done, I know carnal activity again with the next guy will be easy for her. She'll start eating better, gain some weight and guys will be hitting her up in no time. My point is she'll move on sexually with ease. I can't do that. I won't do that. I already feel filthy inside and out knowing all the sperm, ball sweat, spit, and stink from other men she subjected me to. I feel she's defiled me, because I've been with her, I feel tainted. She didn't just kill any desire for her, she's killed any desire I have for sex at all. As odd as it sounds, Mari was it for me. She was beautiful, I didn't have a need to look at other women. And I thought what we had was special. Beauty just doesn't even register with me anymore. My mind knows better, but my subconscious thinks all women are like Mari and Rebecca. And that's my struggle, fair or not. I had someone send me a very supportive message of encouragement. Then they said they almost envied me as a soon-to-be single guy who is financially secure. 
He said I'd have no problems meeting women and would be perceived as high value. I thanked him for the support without conveying something that he would look forward to, which would be a source of anxiety for me. I know people hook up left and right, all day every day and everywhere. That is between them and the people they hook up with. Not my thing, but more power to them. I wouldn't want a stranger, even a very attractive stranger, touching me. I'm a personal space kind of person. I cannot fathom meeting a stranger at a bar or on a nap and interacting with them very little before getting physical. Knowing humans often then agree to go off somewhere, remove their clothes and have sex and see no issue with it amazes me. Obviously in a world with Tinder and dating sites, my stance is odd. I'd be contemplating how long it had been since they'd done the very same thing with someone else. The vast majority of people are accepting of the hookup lifestyle. Mari's hookup numbers wouldn't be all that abnormal for the typical single woman these days. And I think most guys would behave that way if they could. I couldn't and wouldn't, plus, obviously never wanted to be with someone who ever has. Part of me feels Mari wasn't forthcoming about her infidelity, just to spite me for what she knew would be my stance. When I said it felt like she was making a statement, that's the statement it felt like she was making. If I wouldn't even consider a second chance, she was going to do exactly what would hurt and disgust me most. The shit test to end all shit tests, then getting revenge on me without me ever knowing I was being tested. Once the bond we had was broken we could never have that again with each other or anyone else. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity because we are each only granted one life. The continued cheating was what has killed me. If she'd just admitted to what she'd done and we'd divorced, I might, I just might have been able to pick up the pieces and eventually give someone else a chance. It's like she wanted to destroy me so there would be no way in hell I'd ever want to be with anyone again just because she couldn't have me back. Diabolical. And I don't care how many showers were taken and condoms were used, some foreign DNA made its way back to me. Disgusting. I hope her genitals rot out. When Mari and I had only had sex with each other, every action was a pure and beautiful act. Her first act of infidelity destroyed all that had been or ever could be, in an instant. Anyone outside a relationship physically engaging with either partner defiles and poisons the relationship forever in a nanosecond. It's like the relationship is a tall glass of cold milk. The second her lips touched the lips of another man, that was like placing one drop of Indie ink into the milk. It's just one drop, it's still mostly milk. Pay no attention to the rapid discoloration, it probably tastes the same, just go with it right? But instead of telling me about the one drop of ink she let me drink the milk. Not only did she keep letting me drink the inky milk, she kept adding ink. Some people are like a glass of milk with one drop of ink. Mari is now a glass of ink with one drop of milk. She's a defiled slut of no value as anything but a prostitute or a fluffer. The night she was conceived I wish someone had run up and kicked her dad's testicles so hard they hit his spleen just so he couldn't reproduce again. The world would be a better place. The things most people get a rush from pertaining to new relationships cause me massive anxiety. I remember getting butterflies with Mari. The feeling made me nauseous. I even had to get used to someone as pretty as Mari whom I liked invading my personal space. It's not a self-esteem thing. She and I were both outgoing around each other but introverted by nature. Figuring out how to really kiss, feeling that closeness for the first time, I had to ease into it. Everyone thinks all teens are hormonal horn dogs, but she and I actually weren't. We very slowly progressed things physically as we learned and grew more comfortable. I was taught that was the way it was supposed to be. That's what I wanted. That's what she swore to me she wanted as well. The thought of trying to be intimate with someone new makes me cringe. But of course, now the thought of Mari is like the antidote to Viagra. It's all too much. I find myself ashamed more every day to be part of the human species. My life wasn't supposed to go this way. We had so many beautiful moments awaiting us as a family but, memories are destroyed, and those moments will never be. At the end of the day, I loved Carrie, but I had to let her go because our relationship was forced upon us from day one, against our will. 
by adopting her I'm telling her if given the chance, because I have given myself the chance, I'll choose her as my daughter all over again. When the judge asks her if she wants me to adopt her, it will be her with all that love for me returning. Full circle. Things set right, or as right as they can be. I can never be her father. That title belongs to some guy walking around not knowing he has a six-year-old daughter. But I'm the only dad she will ever know. Protector and provider, long after any legal obligation would have lasted. I've done what I had to do to keep my sanity even when others questioned my actions or accused me of being cruel. I've done what I thought was needed to allow Mari's two biggest victims to stake their claim to what was never truly theirs. I've made mistakes in how I have handled things. I won't know they were mistakes until much further down the road. But I've done my best. I will try to do another update when I can once more issues are finalized. I apologize for the lapse between updates and the length. I will try to do better on both as I and the kids press forward together. Peace and thanks to all. Previous posts. TL slash DR, my name has been removed from my now stepdaughter's birth certificate, who will no longer be my stepdaughter after I divorce her mom. But I have applied to legally adopt her as well as get custody of her and our son. I hate my soon-to-be ex-wife, but that hate is for valid reasons and I'm working to release it. I'm doing everything I can to make her life hell until that hate is gone. Carrie and Michael are going to both realize they have a great dad. That really means a lot, so thank you. At the end of the day that is what's important for them and me. Please let me, us, know how things are going. Remember you are important to more people than you know. I appreciate that. And it's a good thing to keep in mind. I spent my entire married life putting others first. I still need to focus on the kids. Learning to focus on myself takes time and change. Your story and how you handled it despite the FUBAR circumstances involved. Man you are a true soldier and definitely battle tested just in different conditions. PS got speed to you, your kids and others dear to you as you all navigate this mess and life beyond IT as well. You sir, are by far one of the strongest men I know of. You deserve a loving and loyal woman who will complete you and I know one day in the future you will find her or she, you. Hope to see more updates from you in this journey, for you are an inspiration to many. I'm no stronger than the next human, but thank you. I'm learning as I go. If one word I write can help someone going through something similar, it was worth it. I honestly believe all, or at least most people have an inner strength they don't even know about because they have never had to rely on it before. I hope they never do. But when someone is diagnosed with cancer, a loved one passes unexpectedly, they encounter financial ruin etc that strength is there to get them through. As far as anyone else in the future goes, it's just not worth it. There was one person I didn't think I could live without, now she's gone and I'm still living. That proves I need no one in my life at the end of the day. Any benefit a woman could bring to my life is dwarfed by the potential chaos she could also bring. Vegas would call that a sucker's bet, and I'm not playing with house money anymore. We hope you have enjoyed today's episode. Please comment, like and subscribe. Cheers. Have a wonderful day or night. Wherever you are, 